Okay, I'm starting a timer. I'm setting a timer for 20 minutes so that we can rant about the pandemic for 20 minutes and then we have to stop. Okay. okay. So tell us, Grace, what do you think is happening with the, the pandemic that's in the past tense and fully over now? <laughs> okay, so I won't just scream. You got a little cough going on, I see. <laughs> so I won't just scream. <laughs> um, no, so apparently the pandemic's over and we have no restrictions in hospitals anymore. But COVID is the third leading cause of death in the United States. So I don't understand why we don't have any restrictions to prevent the third leading cause of death in the United States. But I'm supposed to stop eating red meat and go to a plant-based diet because of heart disease. Don't forget our gas stove. Oh, and the gas stove, yeah. we gotta get rid of that. But we're not taking any precautions for the third leading cause of death in the United States, even in a hospital setting. The thing I, I found yesterday, or read yesterday, that kind of, I'm stunned is the wrong word, but kind of like, you know, you think you're as jaded as you can get about this stuff, and then you're like, you look wait, at it, and you're like, I just go, what? They like double take, is um, all the, so there's a long COVID study going on. Yes. In, in a, I don't, don't even remember which hospital. I'm sorry, I'm a bad... Uh, Bad researcher. Researcher, but no footnotes. halfway through the study, all the all the medical staff studying the the uh, patients, working with the patients, mm -hmm. suddenly went mask free. Yep. The patients all quit the study. Yeah, all quit the study. Um, and like I know of two reasons why this is bad practice. Yep. One is. You're going to infect the patients, right? right. Or they're going to infect you right. if they're reinfected. Or, or even if they have persistence that is yeah, transmissible. Yeah, right. And then the other is, you've suddenly changed the parameters of the study. Yes. You've suddenly added a big confounding variable into the mix, which was not, not present at all before, but it was minimized. Minimized. Right. Minimal. Which yeah. is, yeah, which is you're going to have... Um, you say this non sociocomic or no, no so <laughs> whatever that word no is. Nosocomial. Nosocomial, that's right. Okay, sorry. Also, iatrogenic is another word. Iatrogenic, right. Yeah. That one I can remember better. Nosocomial or, infections. Or the, 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 the easy update hospital acquired. Hospital acquired. Or healthcare acquired. Yeah, yeah. Infections where you went for because of your, you know, one thing or the same thing and now you're worse. Oh, did you know that um, no, nosocomial, iatrogenic, HAA, um, HAI infections um, of COVID um, run a 10 to 12% risk of death? I had heard that. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? It is interesting. So, like, so you're sick and you get COVID in a healthcare setting where you went to get care, and then now you have a 1 in 10 chance of dying. Did you know that um, a recent study showed that uh, people who had have long COVID now, yeah, their COVID infection, yeah, was was mild. They were never hospitalized for oh, it. Oh, right. Yeah, that's a thing. It was, a, a, and that's the case with with me. Yep. You know? yep. So, um, so this kind of buttresses my theory, basically, that. Um, Somehow between reinfection and vaccination, you wind up having a less than stellar, immune less response. than thorough immune response to an infection, yeah. and which either results in lingering effects or the immune damage results in all kinds of downstream degradations and inflammations and trigger pathways of, of things continuing to go on and, well, and sensitize and, your body to, you know. And I have to say, it has been a minority report since 2020 that, um, so like you go to the hospital and you nearly die from COVID. Right. Um, the incidence of long COVID in that cohort is smaller than it is in people who had a very mild infection. Right. That was no different than a... Um, and really, I'm, for some people, it is no different than a cold. Their immune system does not mount an extraordinary response 
they seem to clear the acute illness yeah, completely. With, completely within a week or two. Yeah. And then months later, they will have a long, they'll start experiencing long COVID. Yeah, that's exactly what. That's the higher incidence case. Yeah. And we've had that as a minority report since 2020. I, but it does make me wonder what the mechanism is. So if you're like in a hospital bed, you yeah. know, on a ventilator or not or whatever, you're, you're actually forced to rest a lot, right? Yeah. And that sort of radical rest is well known in the long COVID community to be helpful. Helpful. You know, to minimize your, your, um, I don't know, break, not, not breakthroughs, but like meltdowns or what, your, uh, your, your energy collapses, your right. bad days. Your, well, and, and your recovery. Yeah. But did you recover enough to right. not develop long COVID or, and, and there's sort of a spectrum where right. people have um, some mild symptoms that right. are, um, unpleasant right to people who are bed bound right and yeah. there's everything in between and I, I suspect that a lot of these sudden deaths are oh, actually yeah. people with long COVID who are pushing through their pushing COVID. their fatigue and their symptoms and until something gives collapses, out collapses right something yeah. gives out collapses right? right and then I think there's also this thing where people are trying to um, and I feel like it's I feel like some of this comes from a legitimate and good place where people want to be very careful to say that long COVID is this and not that. Yeah. For my part, since we actually don't understand what we're looking at, except in the context of long SARS from 2003. Yeah. Uh, where there are a constellation of related illnesses, right, that follow on from your acute infection. I think we really need to start thinking about long uh, 1918 well we'll get to that we'll yeah. get to that but um, and what we find when we do that is the re- the way that all these things that seem disparate are related is actually not the blood clots it's actually not you know this or that what is actually what actually connects them all appears and I don't know this yet we don't have good data for this effect yet but it appears to be persistent infection Yes. That appears to be what connects everything that's happening in long COVID. Uh, and it might present as blood clots. It might yeah. present as a stroke. It might present as a psychotic break. It might present as um, persistent fatigue. It might pre- present as all uh, yeah. loss of smell, yeah. ongoing, ongoing loss of smell. It might present as ongoing fevers. A pretty terrifying thing that I've read is long COVID is associated with your body beginning... Your, your brain tissue beginning to accumulate Louis bodies. Yeah. Which Louis body creates dementia. something called, yeah, exactly, Louis body dementia, which is one of a variety of types of dementia that are available to you now at no charge. <laughs> and this can start to be triggered. This is associated with aging. Yeah. It's not an inevitable consequence of aging. Yeah. I think all of us know, or at least should know, someone who made it to uh, quite a ripe old age without Alzheimer's, without, you know, vascular dementia, without these various... So, oh, absolutely. I, I, you know... So, But it's so common in aging that it's like people just think, oh, well... Oh, it's just it's getting older. It's you know. inevitable, but I don't think I, it needs to be. It doesn't, it doesn't need to be. And I don't think it actually is inevitable, right? Yeah, yeah. But, um, but yes, all these things that appear to be disparate... Are seem to be connected by persistent infection, and that seems so. Instead of trying to like say, okay, this is like post-COVID psychosis, this is post-COVID vascular the, the damage, other thing. and so on. The other thing, other thing, and yeah. talk about these as if they are unrelated, when in fact they appear, they really appear to be related by persistent infection. I'm not. I'm, you can actually address all of them medically by curing the persistent infection or by reducing the persistent because actually we haven't cured AIDS yeah, we right. have reduced infe- the infection level to a point where you're not symptomatic well the same thing with hepatitis right? right we get the viral count down so low that it's not detectable it's, no, or... it's not detectable and it's not and you're not and importantly you're not symptomatic because the symptoms are what kill you right? yes yeah so um Interesting. Because I hadn't heard. That's the thing. I, I'm not sure that I'm 100% ready to go there. 
I believe that you know the infection can start like a cascade of all these these you know positive feedback loops that, that cause all this damage like vascular damage but I hadn't seen really convincing evidence that there's always persistent infection well the reason you haven't seen the evidence for that is that we only collect the data on autopsy of, on autopsies yeah. or one like on a third of living people or on autopsies mm -hmm. That's okay. the only time we're collecting that data. I think if we had the data, the evidence would already be there. It's possible. I just, I hadn't. But yeah, you I know. mean, but it, 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 that's that suggests treatments, you know. Exactly. Exactly. And I think the other thing. So I think it's somewhat well-meaning. To this is where I think it's well-meaning. If you are a cardiologist and you can't address post-COVID psychosis, but you can address vascular damage. Maybe you just want to talk about that and what you actually know. And yeah. I think that's reasonable. But I think the broader thing that... And this is the public health failure. And I'm, let me be very, very clear when I say failure. I'm convinced at this point that public health is failing on purpose. Yeah, it's being made to fail. It's being made to fail. But if we understand what public health is supposed to do, it is failing in every regard at its job. Yeah. And I, so every in every single way. regard, <laughs> every single way, in every single way, these people should no longer have jobs because apparently there's no reason for them to exist. They, they, there's nothing for them to all do. All they ever decide to do is it's nothing. nothing because there's nothing to do about anything. Right, right. Now, the other piece of this, though, is that um, while it's well-meaning to say I'm a cardiologist, I can address cardiolog cardiolo Card cardiolog cardiological problems. Um, Cardiac that's, problems. Cardiac problems. That's rational. That's appropriate. I get that. But upstream public health needs to look at this and say, you know, we have all these excess deaths. And you know, they are connected in this way from this data. And you know what? Maybe if we treated persistent infection, we could reduce this whole swaths of deaths. Not just yeah. psychosis. Not just yeah. cardiac. Not just strokes. Not just... Um, um, PEM and uh, what PEMS, in, PEMS yeah. and in, uh, POTS and yeah. MBCFS not just that but all of that and similarly there's a case to be made how shall I say if you look broadly MBCFS appears to be an extremely common viral post-viral yes, syndrome. Yeah, and right? not, not remotely limited to COVID. Not remotely limited to COVID. And it seems to affect women more because of dramatic hormone shifts. Right? So the, the it, it's linked it's linked somewhat to hormone changes. Right. And so women are consistently medically gaslighted. Yep. So and this occurs in that population. So we ignore it as a thing. Okay? But as we look more, as we dig more, as we see more broadly, what we discover is that if you know what this person is, the persistent illness this person is struggling with, then you can treat it. And the people who seem to get lucky, if you dig on all those got lucky and cured cases, yeah. like, and, and people will always be like, oh, you know, I took this vitamin and cured me. Oh, I started yoga and cured me. Or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, what, when you dig, if you dig, you always find there was some immune modulation that caused them to clear viral persistence. Every single time. So, um, given that, it looks like we could be 20 or 30 years ahead of this problem if we look at it holistically, rather than pulling it apart by body system. You're saying if we... If we over all these years wasted if we had come to a really good understanding of MECFS and treatments for it. That's true. Yeah. I'm not saying that, but that is oh, 100% true. Oh, you're saying true. now we I'm still 20 or 30 years before we figure this if, out. Because if we start saying, let's look at the vascular issues, let's look at the psychiatric issues, let's look, yeah, and we right, silo them, right, we're right, going right. to spend 30 years before we start yeah. curing. But in other words, it's been, it's been 40 years before AIDS treatment was widespread and normal. It's been available for more than 20. 
Yeah. So it took like 20, 25 years for these treatments to be available, but for it to be widespread and completely normalized that you, you so in other words, you're in the health system, you uh, test positive for AIDS for some other reason, because it's, it's really quite, yeah. it's quite normalized to test you at many intervals. So you're in the health system, you test positive for AIDS, you can begin treatment, and et cetera. Protect your, your partners, et cetera, your family members from, um, from infection. It took us 40 years to get to this point. We're, we don't have to wait 40 years. We have to pause this. for a minute because we're picking up eggs from our nearby egg farmer. Stop the timer. Okay, we got, uh, we picked up how many? We picked up six dozen eggs. Six dozen, which is a typical uh, amount typical, for us for a week. Yeah, typical weeks worth of eggs in the pot's house. We actually, yeah, we should get, we should keep kicking. Yeah, yeah, we don't, we, we're not here for it yet. We don't have the best. We're, we're not ready to manage that. But no, we, uh, the eggs are laying, uh, the eggs are laying, the hens are laying. <laughs> <laughs> and so our supplier has has tons of eggs. Whereas just a few weeks ago, she was a little short. A little short. We used to try and scrape together four. Yeah, but now it's like, yeah, take as many as you want. It's <laughs> fine. Um, yeah, good times. So story. yeah, it, so it's like uh, it's like quiche season at the. <laughs> yes, it is. Oh, I should make a quiche next Friday. A quiche or a, what's the thing I make? Um, frittata. Oh, yeah. Oh, are good. Or just a big scrambled eggs. All the above. Fantastic. Yeah, okay. We're continuing. Sorry. Yes, so my, my only point here is that um, looking holistically at long COVID allows us to skip 40 years. Because if we know what we already know about AIDS and viral persistence, and hepatitis C and viral persistence, um, measles and immune damage, if we already know all that, we have, we can skip... 30 of those 40 years. We can skip 35 of those 40 years because we also already have a stable of antivirals. We also already have, and we abandoned this effort, actually, we were doing this in 2020, we effectively abandoned this financially, an effort of repurposing existing drugs for treatment. Yes. You may yeah. have heard lots of fanfare about it in 2020. The funding's gone. That's yeah. why you're not hearing yeah. anything else. No, there's still a, there's a number of, um, of antibody treatments and antiviral treatments that people occasionally pop up and say, hey, this is... But the trials are too small and they're not getting approved. They're not getting approved. They're right? moving we're, into the process. So in, yeah, so in 2020 and 2021, you were seeing fast-track approvals and funding and and really a full-scale effort at things. And that's gone now. That's what actually Indian Public Health Emergency does. Yeah. I mean, there's this sort yeah. of like public effect where um, suddenly we're going to see all protections rolled back. But the, like the sort of like structural ground level effect that's hugely destructive is all that money is gone. All that fast tracking for um, treatments is gone. That's not a thing now. Right? So, so yeah. So we're kind of, we're kind of fucked with long COVID as a society, just to be clear. And I think people don't quite grasp how deeply fucked we are. They just don't. They don't and, because and, and it takes not... eight years to make a physician. Long COVID can destroy a physician in six weeks. Yeah, they're not seeing it. They're not seeing it all around them. Right. And they're not Somehow. seeing. And they're not seeing it in themselves because basically they have absorbed the narrative that it's not a thing. Well, and and also that narrative is built on huge amounts of experience. Lyme wasn't real for decades. Right. Lyme disease right. was not real. Right. It was in your head. And yes, it's true. There's a psychiatric symptom for advanced Lyme disease. Yep. Absolutely true. Um, it doesn't mean you treat Lyme disease via cognitive behavioral therapy. therapy. That's not the way you treat Lyme disease because that's I mean, that, not going to work. That's like, you know what, it has a role. You can help people with the trauma they've experienced Experience. trying to get medical treatment. Yes, there's a here. role, but yeah. But that is, curing it is not the role. But that's not. So, um, so we also have this long history. And actually, what you were describing just a bit ago about Parkinson's in the yes. 1918 pandemic, where, oh, Parkinson's is just genetic. Actually, that's an outcome that's widespread in the population 
because of the 1918 pandemic. We were talking about how my grandfather and possibly a lot of other people who have passed now, you know, but late in life had Parkinson's and heart disease, and that wasn't an inevitable part of aging. And in many cases, those could have been related to their exposure to the uh, to the 1918 pandemic. pandemic. Right, yeah. because we don't have, there is no framework for connecting your viral illness to later sequelae. sequelae yeah. yeah, there's no, no one does that. So like people are sick with COVID in April and then in May, they have a psychiatric event. They don't connect those two right. experiences. In my case, it was um, infection in early January of last year. And then the, the long COVID uh, fatigue really, really started hitting me in March. Right. And I was never sick. That's right, you were never that sick. Never so, symptomatic to speak of, you know. It is normal to not connect those two events. Yeah. It's So people, like, they get sick with COVID. Two months later, they are sick constantly. They don't connect those two events. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to wait into. Uh, we actually hit our timer, but, our timer, I, but I, don't really, I don't really care. <laughs> I just wanted to try and encourage us to move. To, to, but now we like, just kind of got started, so. Yes, but to get something down in the recorder while we're running this errand, because this is, you know, is I, I realize it's loud in the background because we're in the car. But this is, but this this is our quiet time. This is our quiet time. Yeah, because you know our home is chaos and a fun kind of chaos mostly, but chaos. But chaos. Um, but I, I want to, we talked about a little bit about how, um, also I have to think my way into my topic, like I didn't write notes, right? so, but um, how, you know, we were doing all this research into treatments, into antivirals and, and antibody treatments and whatnot, um, and that's largely been defunded and not pursued, but the other aspect of that is we're now on a single vaccine train. Right, and we're we're that keeps on rolling. That train's going to keep rolling, um, you know. And it is the mRNA technology, and in pretty it, it, and it's really just Pfizer. It's really just Pfizer. And at least at least around here, it's just Pfizer. Yeah, around here, it's just Pfizer. But the, and the thing is, no one is willing to acknowledge that. You know, I mean, you can be. You can be pro vaccines in general, and still acknowledge that you know what, as a vaccine goes, this vaccine isn't working all that well. If I mean, here's what I mean by that: if you need a, a quarterly dose, a shot, to prevent the worst side effects, the the worst acute effects of infection, right? But it does really nothing to ultimately help you completely clear the virus and completely avoid long COVID. long COVID, that's not a very good vaccine. Yeah. And we need to look at the history of vaccines and say, historically, it's been very rare to have a vaccine that was developed and worked really well right off the bat, right? No, that's not a thing. It's not a thing. It takes years to get it right. And in the case of like influenza, we never do quite get it right. It's, you know, an ongoing thing. Right. Because the virus mutates so quickly, accumulates mutations so rapidly, that you have to just sort of take a roll the dice and take a best guess as to what strains need to be in the in the uh, your shots. Correct. And even and if you get it right, then you've alleviated a fair number of severe influenza cases. Right. But if you, especially in the elderly and you know very young, very old, et cetera, or but if you don't get it right, which they often don't, it doesn't really help much. Yeah. I mean, there are, there are some years that the flu vaccine is 10% effective. Yeah. Like, you know, stops 10% of infections. And COVID-19, yes. with the letter RIP strategy, is mutating at least probably faster. Faster than the... the yeah. I, don't, I mean, I don't know on well, an absolute scale, like how fast mutations it, accumulate. Influenza and, and coronavirus is not... The no, they're not. They're not. So, and coronaviruses, our common cold is a coronavirus. And that's well, the, I looked this up. I was studying oh, this. Uh, okay. And it is, from what I understand, about 15% of what you call common colds yep. are coronaviruses. Yep. The other 85% are slightly, are different. Are different know, viruses. You know, rise, 
rhinoviruses, and et cetera. That just means it lives in your nose, right? Viruses, et cetera. Right. <laughs> right. So, but there, are, so there's, I was like, what do we really know about coronaviruses per se? And the, the ones that we really know about, aside from uh, coronaviruses that are endemic in the animal population, mm -hmm. are the human outbreaks of MERS and, MERS and SARS. We have a lot of data on those. Oh, we have we, a lot of data on those those viruses. We did because we did a lot of investigation. Because yeah, they were well, really because they outbreaks. were they were very dangerous. They were very dangerous outbreaks. The other and the other coronaviruses that we're most familiar with are not as dangerous. Right. Now, mind you, those coronaviruses have always been deadly for immunocompromised people. Just yes. to be clear. So, like when our godson was in cancer treatment, I elected not to see him. Because, because been, the, the mild cold you had could have been a I virus that would have been... Right. And I didn't have a mild cold. I had seen someone who had a mild cold. Oh, so and just I, indirectly. So indir So I was not going to take the risk of exposing him... You were exposed. Yeah. Because I was exposed. Because yeah. it, it was, a, you know, these kids were just ordinary children. They were sick. And their mother didn't say anything when she said, yeah. come play with my kids. Come play with my kids. And then after I, as I was leaving, she said, oh, I hope you guys don't get sick. You know, so-and-so have been sick for... Yeah, days. thanks. Like, what? Thanks. So, whatever. Now, it, and we didn't get sick, right? Now, it is it is true. And this is... A, people throwing up all this chaff. Right. It is true that when you have young kids in this in a school system, well, they run just, through just this... The, they are like just a conveyor belt of viruses. Well, and actually, when I was in school, they were... They are the natural stay. repository right. of human viruses. Right. They right. live in children under five. Right, and who like insist they're like driven to like I don't know lick each other's noses and stuff. You know whatever they do. Looking but they do not have any. Um, they don't give each other any personal space, and they're gross as hell about touching and licking things and putting things in their mouth. Wow. So you know, that's just how. That's how it works. That's how it works. So when we had young children at home who were in kindergarten, preschool, you know, whatnot. We were sick all the time. All the time. Like, even any, any kind of events, right? we, we had a, We had all the, even the more exotic ones they would bring home. We had fist disease, we had hand, foot, and mouth. We had, you know, all, all these, uh, yeah, the, the, the ones that are the sort of the less uh, glamorous childhood diseases. Jesus. And generally, in healthy people, they aren't. They're just really annoying. It's annoying. annoying. It's, not a, it's not a disaster. It doesn't. Right? Like destroy your body. But our godson was in ke was undergoing chemotherapy, right, right. and there was no way I was going to expose him to some unknown right. viral illness. Yeah. Even if it was asymptomatic in me. But we right. have we have normalized now, ha having kids and being sick all the time, right. and everyone going to work in school. Sick because all the time. Because we have to. Right. Because we don't have sick leave, and we don't have this and that and the other thing. That would support us in actually healing, and and really. The thing we've not talked about as a society is how it's actually always been dangerous for elderly people to get sick. Yeah. It's always been dangerous for immunocompromised people to get sick. Sure. For pregnant women and babies to get sick. But we kind of love always it, too, true. which is why we call pneumonia the old man's friend, right? Yeah, we kind of love it. Oh, oh, look, he finally met his old friend. And, yeah. You know, now he's in a better place. <laughs> or, but, well, one, that's one way to look at it. Yeah, right. Yeah. But now it's a sick way. But I did want to. Did, we talked at one point. We had a conversation about your history with a child with asthma, and how this um, conveyor belt of infections right. is harmful. Right, it's absolutely harmful. Is not just trivial. It's right. not a trivial. I mean, when we had hand, foot, and mouth disease, I stayed home from work for a couple of days. We sort of isolated. And we all were itchy and had like had these, you know. This, Lump, we, what do they call welts, welts. or wheels or what are, hives welts uh, yeah. on our hands and everything faces our and, hands our feet and our mouths yeah <laughs> right and, and that was really annoying but no one needed to go to the ER and everyone recovered as far as we could tell completely but some of these respiratory viruses especially if you're prone from a, to asthma from a young age they are actually dangerous to you yes. and they having infections over and over again makes your asthma worse and makes right. you more susceptible to more severe asthma attacks, right? Right. And what I actually found was that, so I could, so his first year in school as an asthmatic, full-time school, previously he went to a Montessori school with, um, 
you would call them now very careful infection uh, controls. What they were in class was um, Montessori practical life. Yeah, well, right. because Maria Montessori came from a world that still had traditional wisdom about how to prevent, you know, infections Infection spreading else, through right? a school. Right. And so this was; these were very practical norms where part of your education was washing up, Cleanliness, washing yourself, yeah. cleaning this, disposing properly of a tissue, etc. And so he went three days a week for like three hours. Yeah. And um, was relatively well and healthy. In that experience, didn't have tr asthma triggers coming from that experience right. constantly, right? Yeah. But he went for like what a year or two, three days a week. No, first two days a week and three days a week, three hours. And then the next year was kindergarten. Yep. And when he went to kindergarten, he was sick as frequently as he was well. I mean, literally. Yeah, half, so half off. <laughs> he was half off. So like he would have a, a good week where he was well, and then he'd be sick for a week, and he'd be back well sick for a week and I this is a whole long saga with the school system that I'm not going to get into but he was just sick that whole first year well, it was I, terrible I, I do want to say at one point they sent a truant officer to your home which seems like a joke but which seems was, like a joke but no, for, for real yeah. they actually sent a truant officer to the home for a five year old like, right. what, do you, what do you think he's doing right. he's homesick no, he was not out you know like he a, wasn't turning he tricks he wasn't gang banging or no, dealing nothing. drugs no right. drugs none of that <laughs> um, he was just at home. he was an asthmatic five year old homesick yeah using his inhaler and watching cartoons right? that's what was happening yeah right and um, drinking lots of fluids. Right. And, uh, and you know, and his teacher knew, the school nurse knew, the principal knew. I'd spoken to them, I'd written it down, and I documented it in writing. I had the doctor. Yeah, he had notes, you had notes from the, the doctor. doctor. Right? right? We had all that documentation, but the yeah. sense of the truant officer. Uh, yeah. And, and it wasn't just rough. needed to make sure he wasn't actually working in a slaughterhouse. Okay. Exactly. Just to be sure. That's why they were. Um, totally about child protection. Yeah, not not because they wanted some way of punishing you and get you in the criminal justice system. Right. But no, so he was, um, so that was a rough year. And like I said, he, he, attended, uh, he didn't basically have time. Um, and after that first year... Turns out, going to those grades half time is good enough. It's good enough. You can learn everything. <laughs> learn you learn everything you know half time. It's fine. It was good. And he was always ahead. Always scored well in standardized tests. Right. Um, so... That was the first year. We went to a different school for first grade after that whole experience. And um, and he, he was sick once a month, maybe. Maybe. and But infrequently. And he would use his inhaler maybe once or twice a month. By third grade, we were fed up with public school. And um, he stopped, um, we stopped going. We started homeschooling. So, so this was like five to eight. And at eight years old, we started homeschooling. And do you know that by the time he was 12, he had stopped using his inhaler at all? Yeah. yeah. And by the time he was 18, yeah. he hadn't used his inhaler in, in five years, I, five, six years. No, I, I knew I had friends in college who came in as freshmen with asthma mm -hmm. and brought know, inhaler, medications, all the medications and their nebulizers and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And after a year or two of being in a more adult situation where people... <laughs> Aren't sharing viruses as a matter of course? Quite as, quite as readily. Not right. that people were masked in classrooms or whatnot, but that they lived, you know, they weren't all uh, on the playground together, you right. know, or whatever. They lick at each other's noses and whatnot. Yeah, um, as one does. That, that, you know, that they, that they outgrow them. I think also there is a tendency to outgrow childhood as well. But, well and I think the outgrowing is moving yeah, out of certain viral this, this stage of chronic reinfection. The chronic reinfection, right? Yeah. So it's because yeah. as soon as that was gone from his life in eight, by the time he was 12, he wasn't using it. By the time he was 18, he didn't use it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that's part of his medical record and should always be attended to and always be understood to be a risk factor for him. So he's still. Yeah. But it, yeah. But it was no longer a defining feature of his life. Right. Yeah. I had. And I. I have a, a genetic condition called alpha one antitrypsin deficiency. I have a mild version of it, which is called like an insufficiency rather than a zero level. Zero. Right. But it does, I think, put me at a higher risk for infection. And during childhood, I had chronic bronchitis and was often out. Like I don't know. Recall at least three or four times I was out with bronchitis mm -hmm. and quite sick. I remember having to get suppositories for uh, for uh, fever reduction, you know. Like, 
all this stuff. And then... Suppositories that you could remember? Wow. What? Suppositories that you remembered? No, I remember that experience having to get suppositories as a, as a, as a young child. Yeah, I'm, I'm just shocked that you remember oh, that, that far re- back. Oh, uh, yes. Usually when you get to... Oh, no. I, well, you're then, young enough to get suppositories? Oh, no. You're not I old was, enough to remember. This was... I was like... Because I couldn't keep anything down. Oh! I was like, I don't know, eight, eight or nine or something. And you couldn't... Oh, you kept vomiting. Oh, that's yeah, the other reason. Right, yes, you right, can, yes, right. Yes. Yeah. Got it. Sorry. Right. No, not because I was a baby. Baby. I'm like, wow, you remember when you were like nine months no, old? No, 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 no. No. They, they use them in older kids who can't... Who can't stomach anything. Yeah. Yes. Got it. Right. So, um, from coughing, you know. Oh, right. So, anyway, that was fun. Yeah, it was fun. But, and Good then, way, of way. course, years and years of allergy shots and all that. But that's mm-hmm. another story. But, yeah. Um, so, I do know a little bit about what it was like to be chronically sick. Mm-hmm. And... Um, it's not fun at all, and we should stop doing it as a matter of course, and we should stop normalizing it and it's, saying, oh, this is just normal, and they're just, uh, and we should stop valorizing it. That's like, well, like it's valorized as like tough or healthful. Or the, that it actually, is healthful. Well, th- that it actually is every time you do this, you're strengthening your immune system. Right. Which is actually just, that's a recent like uh, disinformation campaign. No. Right. It's the only sense that it's true in is that some components of your immune system develop memory, and so if they see the same infection again, they can fight it off more readily and earlier. Right. But your immune system is finite. Like, your heart will only beat a certain number of times in your lifetime before it gives out, right? Right. And the, your immune cells age, mm-hmm. and they can be aged prematurely. Yes. And by overusing them, by when you're playing with chronic infection, you're actually not strengthening your, you're not like building up your immune system, doesn't have little tiny muscles in it. No, no, that's not how it works. You actually are depleting your capacity to, to, uh, to do that, to fight not just viruses, but cancers, For cancers. and yes. all kinds of other things that can go wrong in your body. So, so yes, we, and we, the, this real straight up disinformation about. Um, building your immune system, immune strengthening yeah. by getting sick. Um, uh, I, I do think it's still good to get your childhood vaccines and good to get to to be exposed to some common strains that you will develop an immune memory to in but, the sense that it will help you keep not get sick if you're exposed to those things again. But it's a real good idea to delay the exposure. Delaying that... Mentioned, yeah, you know, that was something you talked about when we had our discussion about about um, that your history with uh, the kid with asthma. It was like, your, oh your, yeah, your, what your doctor was actually saying. We had a, you had a pediatrician who was actually not a not a moron, right? <laughs> well, that's not, that's not, he's moron, not an idiot. Uninformed, not, not uninformed. Okay, who was who, no- was who was who was like had. S- good sense, let's say. Yeah, good sense, and he was old school. He was old school, and um, we've come to realize that, you know, we, we might have thought in some points in our lives that, oh, that person's got old-fashioned ideas and whatnot. But actually, it turns out. Turns out. <laughs> yes. Well, so what, and one of his things was that you know it's it's actually to his benefit to delay to exposures. Delay. So his body is his system, his lung size too. His lung size, but all Everything. of his systems are more robust to withstand an infection right. because it's weight gain lung size and his immune system and i think this is an important thing that i think people are conflating when they talk about developing develop immune, building up your immune um, muscle yeah so to speak there's no immune muscle yeah um uh, one analogy i've heard i've heard several good ones is like it's more like a a, a, a photo album Yes, like if, every yeah, time your immune system sees something, it takes a picture so you can recognize it when you see it again. Right, okay. right, right. Um, and some viruses will erase the photos. <laughs> and some viruses will erase the photos that you have in your immune system. Yeah, okay? Yeah. Um, it's more that you don't, you want exposure to bacteria, mild bacteria. I'm not saying like go out and give your kids E. coli. E. coli but stuff. let them play in healthy, vibrant soil. 
right? Yeah, yeah. Because exposure to those things... We seem to be primed to need and want that. To need and want that. Yeah. Um, at a young age, so under age five, you want exposure to that kind of play and that kind of unrestricted play in clean soil because that exposure is what develops your immune system. I think you even want those... Scraped knees and elbows. And those scraped knees and elbows. Yeah. That is something that, that's work for your immune system to do, that it learns how to do it. No, you don't want stitches on your two-year-old. Right, right. But a scraped knee that yeah. your body then says, oh, look. And, you know, yeah, you should wash the, clean them up. You should clean them up and whatnot. We're not talking about, um, and you should bathe your kids. Yeah. But but you know what? You can skip a few of those baths. It's all right. Yeah. And the sort of... Pig pen was the healthiest. Was the healthiest the, kid <laughs> in the in bunch. The <laughs> And this is so it's like this hygiene theory. What it's about is exposure to bacteria and soil yeah. and the way that it helps your, your immune system come to understand how to function. And not and be hypersensitive and to allergens. We've, right. We've discovered that through yeah. like the boom in allergen uh, right. um, um, allergies amongst young children who live in these pristine suburban environments that are very clean and very sterile and they play on clean well, sterile playgrounds they're unnaturally sterile un un the... like unnaturally so right so they haven't had the kind of early system exposure that trains an immune system to function at all and then it overshoots mm -hmm. when it's exposed to anything even yeah. foods that are otherwise fine and safe i'm not and saying you should give your kids ringworm and make them you know no no that's not it at all yeah. but just like ordinary play in healthy soil is the function that develops your immune system is what we've seem yeah. to have discovered yeah. and um and really that that's what's informing a lot of current allergy therapy where they slowly introduce and acclimate your immune system to an allergen so that your body can tolerate it mm -hmm. okay um that's actually the thing that's being conflated and turned into hey all the viruses all the time it's great for your immune get system get them all over with early get them all over with early which has been common yeah. for a long time is yeah. from the medical throw the baby in daycare right and... everybody except my oldest pediatrician was saying get them sick as often as you can our nurse friends his godmother a nurse was like oh gosh just put them in daycare and get them through all those we, illnesses we should i mean we hear so often from nurses saying uninformed things that we should keep in mind that nurses often spout off beyond their level of training you know a level of training and expertise yeah. right and they are speaking from their experiences but understand the perspective is not uh, the perspective of our experiences is limited yeah right so this frame and reality where we're encouraging children to get sick all the time and think of it as as a uh, um, not just value neutral but but positive is actually perverse yeah and what we actually have known for a very long time as human beings is that it's good to avoid illness. It's Especially, good to avoid illness. Yeah, it's good to avoid illness. And there are very basic traditional ways we have avoided Wait, excess it, illness. For a long time. And that especially you want to protect young children uh, during pregnancy and old age. Mm -hmm. But those are really crucial times to protect people from illness. Yeah. And we've inverted that now that there are no protections necessary for those groups because they have, what I, I'm thinking of is like this sort of almost magical myth of extraordinary ability. Mm -hmm. Like um, pregnancy is a disability, but it's extraordinary. Your body has extraordinary, you know, like mythical powers. powers. Super powers. You can, if you're, if, uh, you know, you come across a kid who's been run over by a car when you're pregnant, you'll be able to pick up the car and pull the kid to Pull the kid's safety. Like, right. right, right? At which yeah, is, I remember reading Something like that, yes, right? Crazy and stories like that. I don't want to denigrate or dismiss the the raw and awesome power of creating a human being with your body. Yeah, three D printer. It's <laughs> it Whatever. is it is absolutely extraordinary. Original three D printer. And, and and really, there there is a certain magic to it, and it is it is an it extraordinary is, thing. It is humbling to to uh, to watch. So I don't yeah. mean to dismiss that, but we also can't like um um throw away the lived experience of millennia of human beings that this is also a fragile time in a person's life yeah for for both parties it's an extremely fragile time right um yes so um we're gonna take a break i think and then then you need to talk about exercise exercise yeah yeah we're gonna we're gonna take a break um we're here to pick up our gfs Next food so here we are be back in a few minutes oh for the, for the, yeah. Okay, this is for the for our permanent record. 
six pounds of orichette pasta, three lo loaves of seedless rye for backup bread. We make bread, but we don't always keep up with it. Uh, three loaves, uh, three uh, loaves of pita bread, not, not loaves, three bags. Um, six pounds of penne pasta, six pounds of spaghetti pasta, six pounds of fusilli pasta. Kids eat a lot of pasta. A um, couple racks of purified water and this just bottled water in small bottles. And the reason for that is that um, I learned the hard way that watering house plants on our softened water will slowly kill them. Yep. They accumulate too much salt in didn't the we, soil. We almost lost a Hoya, didn't we? We almost lost a Hoya that I've had for over 30 years. And it was decades old when you got it. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's cuttings of cuttings of cuttings. cuttings. Of cuttings right? Yeah. right. So, um, uh, but yeah, fortunately I salvaged most of it and divided it and now I've got a couple big Hoyas again. Um, but yeah, that was a, that was a concern. Um, also almost lost a, a wandering Jew. Is that, can I say wandering Jew? <laughs> That's all I can recall. But should, should there, is there sure some politically correct that. name I should be referring to? The um, uh, anyway uh, that I got from my mom that that almost killed too. Although that's now been divided again, and I have that in a growing in a couple pots from the part that didn't die. Mm -hmm. But it took me a while to figure out what was wrong with it. <sighs> right, mm -hmm. um, nine cans of crushed tomatoes. Um, they are limiting <laughs> how much Coetzee peanut butter you can buy. So we only got one jar of crunchy and one jar of creamy Coetzee peanut butter, which is our favorite peanut butter. And then two uh, cans of tuna. It's like, that's not a lot of tuna. These are these are 30 ounce cans. <laughs> that's huge. They're, like, they're, they're like food service cans. Yeah, they're food service cans. So, um, uh, and yeah, we'll get more next week. <laughs> right? Yeah. Hey, they make a great uh, tuna casserole. Yeah, yeah uh, and tuna salad. Um, then uh, six cans, six thirty ounce cans of of refried beans and six thirty ounce cans of black beans, and that's how you spend two hundred and thirty seven dollars for oh, yeah. staples for, for the basic st staple We're not foods. getting fun food. It's not. It's not that exciting. Fun food exciting. is next, but it's not yeah. that exciting, and it's only like thirty dollars. <laughs> right, like the the snacks. The snacky snacks like the chips for movie night. No, that's a very small part of our food budget. We right. do, we do spend some on it. Right. That, yeah. Well, and although you know what, I I don't think, I I think it is an extravagance to get the chocolate that we get. We. But I also think it's base. It's food. Right. It's it's a cooking ingredient for decent food. We get some very nice um, chocolate from. What is it? Oh, it's not Ghirardelli. It's um, Guitard. <laughs> Guitard chocolate which we have to mail order and uh we've been stocking up on that and basically while it's still cool enough to ship mm -hmm. and that will be basically our it'll be a six month supply of right. of chocolate for cooking for baking for eating yeah um yeah, we got we got some reading mostly it's like baking and, it's and baking. cooking chocolate yeah because you know you know you can make a nice molly with chocolate you make a great chili with chocolate you, well it's that, not just candy. So this was the bill for GFS for this c coming week. Well, my week starts on Friday, right? Oddly, because of my pay cycle and the way my employer works, is Friday is the first day of the week, anyway. So, our, our like, uh, so we we organize our grocery budget on a Friday through Friday yes. basis, um, and we also did a pickup from Sam's Club earlier today. Uh, we got a huge bag of broccoli and uh, 40 pounds of potatoes, yes. 40, and some stew meat, and we're making chili for Pippin's birthday. Yes. So, so that's ongoing today also as well. Yeah. So making a very nice chili amid a spice mix by basically dumping some of everything in the spice cabinet into a container and mixing it up. Not everything. Not li no, I, I pick like up I, the I stuff think, that actually goes... I with... think you left out the everything bagel seasoning. <laughs> nice. There were good. no... I didn't put any basil or things like that in the chili. It was all... Um, oh, that's quite avant-garde. That's avant-garde. It was... Uh, yeah, okay, so here's off the top of my head. 
ginger, um, cinnamon, mm. um, cocoa powder, paprika, uh, smoked paprika, smoked um, chipotle chili powder, um, powdered onion, powdered garlic, and plus two big onions chopped yeah. and sauteed. And then there's some other uh, spices that I'm probably forgetting. Cumin? Oh, a lot of cumin. Yeah, I really like cumin and chili. Yeah. Um, and then that's probably about it for that's the spices. Mm -hmm. um, it's enough. I used to use a lot of black pepper too, but the kids don't like it that kids much. Kids aren't here for it. Not here for yeah, it. so I used to use much. I used to make it much hotter. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we're gonna drive for a bit. I'll turn this back on in a, like a minute or two here. All right. Okay, so we have. Sorry, the eggs are squeaking. You hear that? The, uh, the, as we drive around on Michigan's finest roads. Finest. Smooth as glass. Beautifully maintained. Um, our, uh, our eggs are bouncing just enough for the, uh, the curtains to be rubbing together and go squeaky, squeaky, squeaky. <laughs> <laughs> Drives me crazy. Um, but. Yeah, oh, I, I have to briefly say, uh, anyone who's following my newsletter knows that we lost a whole bunch of appliances in a power spike, mm -hmm. power surge during an ice storm. Uh, and then our power was out for several days, right? It was, <laughs> just, not even 48 hours. It was just under 48 hours, yeah, yeah. right? But um, a lot of, we, were, we actually got off pretty easy as far as how long it was out right because it's been worse we've had longer outages well, not a week but yeah. we've had 72 hour outages yeah um and a lot of people in in the ann arbor area um had outages of a week or longer yes and then they got the power back on and there was another storm and they immediately lost, lost power, power again, again. Right. Yeah. It's fun, fun, fun. Infrastructure week is coming any day now. Yeah. But um, the uh, what did cost us is a number of our appliances were fried by these wild spikes where we saw things just arcing and blowing right. and smoking. Like the air in our house was filled with the smell of burnt electrical components. Right. It was... It was a little Stunning. surreal because we were seeing these huge flashes outside, and the flashes were from the transformers shorting and wires shorting and arcing. arcing. Um, yeah. So, right in the easement next to our house, and I think also down the street, and then also on the. So it was on three sides, like yep. we were seeing these and hearing them too. So, and the. Uh, I think that the. Um, the LED bulbs in the ceiling fan. This is like a sealed light unit in our family room. Actually, blew up inside the unit. So, yeah. I tempted to take it apart when we uh, get that thing down to see what I can find out. Yeah. Um, but anyway, the we we have all these appliances, uh, including um, a refrigerator, including a dishwasher including a laser printer, including a stereo receiver and all that, that are that died, right. including UPS, and, and some less expensive things like a coffee maker and a, a water kettle, mm -hmm. all fried that day, um, that minute. Yeah, that, like it was just as, as soon just as Just a minute, yeah. And um, we had an appliance repair guy out to look at the refrigerator and dishwasher and basically said it would be five hundred dollars per appliance to replace the control panels just to see if they could be brought back to life again right and that wouldn't you know guarantee there was no guarantee there's no guarantee that they could be brought back to life. so a thousand bucks to see if they could work i was like okay well so same thing with the laser printer i actually called a repair shop that specializes in um, repairing HP laser printers and asked them about this model and what happened and they said don't bother, don't bother don't it costs five hundred and forty dollars right the printer yeah. uh, but and it's not worth repairing that's right? surreal the dishwasher like, costs this is what we do twelve hundred dollars 
This is what we do. Right, and it's not worth repairing. I, I don't know that we didn't pay pay for the fridge, but it was a nice fridge, I'm sure, at one point. Yeah. Um, so, anyway, we did get a payout from our insurance company to cover this loss, to cover this replacement cost. Mm -hmm. uh, and then our car immediately needed some very expensive work. Basically, wah, the struts, wah, wah. front struts finally gave out completely, and the transmission was failing. So, it, yeah. it, as things go, it seems like the transmission problem was just some wiring and that was corroded through and not anything else. Yep. And so, just re re replacing that corroded wiring fixed the transmission problem. And the struts are great. It's now driving much better. Um, yeah. But yeah. that that eight half hour appliance repair money. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a sad. We have a sad. Anyway, we're cheering ourselves up by going through a drive through to get some greasy food. Some greasy food. So I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna pause this again. That's why I didn't really want to start because I have to keep pausing. It's but okay. I'm going to pause this again and when we come back we'll for mm -hmm. sure talk about long COVID and exercise. For real this for time. For real this time. Not but yeah, it's because of the constant interruptions. I can't get my head into the topic. But we'll be back. Okay. All right. We've had a snack. You yep. were saying, are we this old couple now that goes through a drive through and gets the meal deal and then sits in the parking lot and splits it? Yes. And or yes, not, we are. technically we aren't because we didn't get the soda. <laughs> but that's actually the only reason we aren't. <laughs> we got chicken fingers, a small chicken fingers and a small fries. This is not really a full meal. This is a snack because we probably will actually be having dinner pretty late. Mm -hmm. um, because we we did get this chili started. Uh, it's now we um, like before. Yeah, while Grace was running an errand this morning the f first couple errands I browned onions and got the spice mix going and all that and then when she brought the meat back she uh, sauteed the meat we got I got all the tomatoes and what beans from the basement mm -hmm. and uh, we got everything into the, the the slow cooker right so it will be having to this evening for movie night yeah. It's Pippin's birthday. So Pippin chooses the meal. Pippin chose um, baked potatoes, roasted broccoli. Mashed potatoes. Oh, mashed potatoes. Roasted broccoli. And chili. And chili. So they actually will put their chili over the potatoes, which, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of a pots thing to do now. <laughs> it is. Traditional. Right, yeah. Traditional pots. Is mash, mash, and chili. But it's reminiscent because I, when we lived in Saginaw, I used to make chili at least at once a week. Yeah. And... Um, but we had quite a few fewer kids. kids. <laughs> we had so much. It's not like we, we were like debating about what size pot we should use for this. We haven't made it in so long for all of us. Yeah. Like the slow cooker is the only thing large enough. Right. So it was. And to be clear, the slow cooker is a 22 quart electric oven. Yep. Yep. So it was. Um, yeah, our biggest frying pan, two large onions, uh, a bunch of spices, and then um, I thought it was going to be six pounds of meat. And being four and a half. It's four and a half pounds of meat, and then um, the, uh, and then I don't know what, five cans of tomatoes. To four, four cans of tomatoes, two cans of paste, and a can of uh, black beans. Two cans of black beans. Two cans of black beans. Oh gosh. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So a fair amount. Uh, Thirty ounce cans. Thirty ounce cans. So, yeah. I have no doubt that the kids will blow through that this evening. There, yep. there may be a leftover. There may be some leftovers. But because I keep making we also meals. Have snacks. You have snacks too. Yeah. Right, so I keep making meals and I keep thinking, oh, this is so much food. There'll be leftovers. And then, like, there's a sandwich left. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's so hard, hardly anything. Like, hardly anything. Like, wow. Because, yeah, we're, we're into the. Uh, <clears throat> all eating all the time phase. The teen, multiple teenagers, basically. Yeah. And they can put food away, and it's not it's not weird or ab abnormal. They're growing rapidly, and they're metabolizing like crazy. <laughs> and, yeah. Well, I remember, you know, at 19 when I could eat a large pizza myself. In and, one sitting. Yeah. And, right. Um, yeah, I could eat. Yeah. 18, 19 year old 
boys just be, not that the girls can't keep up or can't, you know, aren't also contenders, but yeah. boys in particular can put away a shocking amount of food. Amount of food. Well, girls have all these eating disorders like that uh, they've been conditioned to have, right? Yeah. But um, well, but now as 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 a 17, 18, 19 year old, I would shocking. Eat, yeah. I would routinely eat a whole pizza by myself. Yeah. And it was yeah. not abnormal. You. Would you take a moment and describe that sandwich shop that used to make <laughs> these sub sandwiches where they had to like uh, uh, squeezing all the food into the So at UConn, there was University of Connecticut. University of Connecticut, not not Alaska. Yeah, I thought she had gone to she had like learned how to drive huskies across no, the, no, the, the tundra. tundra. No, that was that was not my experience. I did a lot of things, but not that. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, there was this this big Italian sandwich that you would get. Right, yeah. and it was like this special they had, and it the was like special. Yeah, it was like four different kinds of meat, and cheese, and provolone, and lots of veggies. Right, yeah. it's like uh, roasted pepper and le- lettuce, tomato. Um, yeah, all sounds, that, all those were like pickled, <laughs> yeah, those like pickled Italian vegetables, right? Oh yeah. yeah. And so he'd take like a cornichons and cornichons yeah, and all that little yeah. stuff, right? So he'd take like one of those foot long. I guess those are French, but never mind. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The uh, I wasn't gonna correct you. Sorry. The um, of the Italian bread. It's like yeah. a, like a loaf of Italian bread, and he'd slice it in, slice it in half, and he'd take out some of the it, it, the soft bread. So he had mostly just like the crusty bread, mm. but not all of it. There was a little some, and then he'd like layer it all up, yeah. layer it all up. And then, and he was kind of a short guy, and he was kind of behind the counter. Yeah. And I'd see him put like all of his weight, <laughs> like he close it. try to close <laughs> this sandwich. Like he'd be, I need to like push like three or four push <laughs> and push <laughs> and like a little Sorry. grunt, and then like tie and like press the press the, with pressure the it's the wrap around it. Making a panini, yeah. like right, like yeah. but there was no heat involved, okay, right? right. Like, and he would just like wrap it tight. To get this whole thing to hold together and everything to stay inside the sandwich, and then like he'd wrap it a second time and slice it and kind of like burst, burst out the end. At the end. Yeah, right. And um, it oh my gosh! So my brother Ben and I would split one of these for lunch. <laughs> That's how big it was. So my brother Ben was like six five. He was a he was, huge. He was man. a large guy. He was a big guy. Yeah, and he, and he could eat. And he could eat. Yeah. And I don't mean like like big fat. Just like. He had a lot. He needed a lot of calories to keep a lot of muscle function. No, he was he was very very muscular guy. Yes, and he he was built like a football linebacker. Yes, built like a linebacker, and um, looked like Denzel. The uh, um, and and I was you know a fairly typical eighteen year old five foot three girl, and um, well, but except you were a student athlete. I was a student athlete. I was on the rowing team every morning. Fairly elite student athlete. And uh, and so this was enough food for the two of us. Yeah, that's how big and how calorie dense this this sandwich was. So we'd get one of those, bless our hearts, for three seventy nine. Good God! <laughs> it was three dollars <sighs> and seventy nine cents. Well, it's and we'd split one we, for life. We forget how much the value of money has changed because that's what old people do. But, that's what old people do. But um, but it sounds so shockingly cheap now. But, yes, and, but, yeah. and we were like, you know, we'd get the money out of the ashtray. Yeah, right? and we'd my, give my, my sandwiches. In 1990, my lunches at work were two fifty-nine cent bean burritos from Taco Bell, right? So yep. that was a, a a decent lunch for me. With a, uh, I don't know, I guess I'd get a water or something. Not usually soda, but uh, oh no, they or or they there was a little place uh, that would sell me like a tuna croissant sandwich that was really nice. Mm-hmm. Um, with um, I guess that's probably a dollar fifty or something 50. like that. And yeah. this was like nineteen ninety one. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, the, it was an expensive sandwich. It was almost four bucks. Yes. <laughs> right. Right. I, right. Yeah. Well, okay. So we fed our snack, and um, I fed the kids um, oatmeal. I made a big pot of oatmeal. When I say a big pot, I mean I mean like. Uh, what, four cups of oatmeal, oatmeal. six four cups of oatmeal <laughs> at least and is it, is it uh, one of the kids is calling what's that They're probably having an argument they want us to settle oh is she dirty well it's a diaper emergency 
I'm gonna pause. It sounds sounds like one of the kids, one of the babies, has decided that no moss with the diapers. No moss. She's just refusing to wear. No diaper time. Nope, we're not doing diapers. Refusing to, literally refusing to wear a diaper. Not putting that on. I should mention none of the, neither of the babies are potty trained in the slightest yet. Yes. They won't sit on the potty. Yep. So like, okay, this is gonna end badly. It's gonna end badly. <laughs> and I, you know, I may get a point on to fight with my kids about things. Yeah. Okay. So we've but not thought about in a, in a little while. We before too long, we'll need to get. Uh, we'll have to have some kind of reckoning. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I'm looking forward to that. This moment, is a new, like a, completely refusing diapers. Yeah, new, new, new behavior, new behavior. Yeah. So you know, maybe this is the right thing. We'll, we'll see. Maybe she's saying she wants to be potty trained now. Mm. So we should invite her to sit on the potty again. We've got a little nice little seat, a nice little small seat that folds down for the. Yes, we do. All right, so shouldn't worry about falling in. Nothing like that. Nope. Yeah. And the little steps, still so her feet can reach down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I, anyway, parenting is at age 50 and 55. <laughs> Good times. Uh, so. Keeps you young. Uh, exactly. It's <clears> just <throat> like getting infected over and over again. It keeps you healthy. It's so great. Uh, uh, so, I um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the conundrum of exercise for long COVID patients. Yep. Um, because... There's actually a, a TV show, and I think it's in Ireland, that they're doing a clinic where they're trying to, like, it's a reality show where they're trying, this team of doctors is working with a long COVID patient and trying to get him to exercise mm -hmm. and doing exercise stress tests and whatnot and, mm -hmm. and insisting that this will help him. And it, and he's, every time he has a total crash. Total crash every time. Right. Uh, and this is the... There are conditions in which exercising is helpful. This oh, is sure. not one of this them. This is not one of them. And if you have ME, CFS, or POTS, either the POTS is uh, postural orthostatic uh, tachycardia syndrome, tachycardia, where your heart rate goes crazy when you stand and sit and you know change yeah. your, your positioning. positioning. Um, and ME is what, well, I can myelitis or it, yes um i forget anyway chronic fatigue but it's it's, it's, popular it's the new fatigue, yeah so the, the slash cfs stands for chronic fatigue syndrome mm -hmm. and where basically you can't do much without yeah. having a total exhausted collapse where um your autonomic nervous system is going crazy Right. Yes. This autonomy, your heart rate's out of control, your breathing will be out of, will, control. out of control, like you'll have neuropathies, you'll have uh, all kinds of, you know, like people will black out, you yes. know. Myalgic encephalomyelitis. Encephalomyelitis, okay. Anyway. Yep. But, however, it is also the case so the the doctors immediately jump on this, especially people whose background is exercise physiology, right? They're yeah. like, well, I'm a hammer. That's, everything looks like a nail, nail. to me, right? right. Um, there, there is a glimmer of truth to the idea that people who are chronically sick do detrain. Like decondition. Decondition, decondition detrain, whatever you want to call it. Um, however people who came who came up all suddenly with long covid in my case i was walking and exercising very regularly you know a lot i'm not of i was not a long, runner anymore yeah. and i was not cycling anymore but we would routinely go for oh two four mile walks two to yeah several mile walks, walks. Yeah. and um you do not like go from easily can walk a couple miles up and down hills mm-hmm with nothing but you know some some very slight tiredness afterwards right to can't walk up a flight of stairs <clears throat> without getting dizzy you know a quarter mile and you're out for a week that doesn't that's happen in three months that's not de deconditioning no deconditioning i say this because i'm actually now starting to experience deconditioning at this point like a after year, a year 
Right now, Deacon, like I, I don't play guitar for three months. I my lose my calluses and I can't play as well, but I can get mm -hmm. back up to speed pretty quickly, mm -hmm. um, which I'm trying to do now. But, um, but yeah, deconditioning really kicks in like, like after a year or longer. Right, and, where you've spent years like basically bed bound. Yes, and even and, even months bed bound. Right. right, you will start to see like. Muscle atrophy. Uh, a little, right? yeah. Well, you're, you'll see some muscle atrophy, and you'll you'll see some deconditioning as far as your your cardio fitness. Right. But that actually takes quite a while. It takes quite a while for you to really be in a different place. And um, and so people with long COVID and with these conditions to various various degrees of severity are in a real conundrum because to some extent exercise is good for you and if you have loss of peripheral um, capillaries and whatnot right. which i think that i do right because of this virus mm -hmm. um regular exercise is actually good for it's called angiogenesis right can right. can cause your body to to regrow blood vessels and whatnot assuming you're not dealing with a terrible degree of inflammation or you know right. illness but um it also exercise beyond a certain point can totally produce this dysautomnia this crash this right. fatigue this, this collapse you know like mm -hmm. and so we really are and like we're where you can't, where I have to watch myself closely and walk a fine line because I need to be able to work. I'm still our breadwinner, you know, and right. I still have to work eight to eight to I don't know twelve hours a day. Mm -hmm. um, and my work isn't physically demanding, but like yesterday, I was like leading meetings, you know, right. on video calls all day, and that's shockingly fatiguing. Uh, you know, they ask us to have our cam cameras on all the time when we're in meetings so we get to know each other and all that. It's like, uh -huh. it it is very exhausting, actually, to have my camera on all the time. It's like being a little TV presenter, and I can't help but watch myself, you know. Right. And uh, then wondering how I spend a lot of time in an obsessive spiral about how I look to other people and whether my hair looks okay and if I look fat and all that. And it just, it really feeds into my various, um... I have some chickens. You have some chickens? <laughs> I got some little tiny bit in the oh, back I'm of so sorry. <laughs> yeah, we, maybe we should have got the soda. We should have got the soda. Right. Well, um... Anyway, deconditioning. Um, being on camera all day. I paused it because I thought you were going to go... <laughs> like a horrible spitting. Oh, is it on yet? Yeah, it's on now. But I've been oh, paused it for a moment so you so I didn't catch capture you spitting. Oh, that was nice. So yeah. we can talk about it instead. But we'll talk about it instead. Well, you didn't. I, you were coughing I was instead. coughing, right. No, I got like a, just like a little bit of breading like in the back. Yeah. Of so we didn't get the drink because no, we, <coughs> we don't want to drink soda. Right. And we do have some bottled water in the back. It, I mean, <laughs> I don't want to drink the bottled water. So drink, drink the plant water. Drink the plant water. I'll drink the plant water. So get a, get a, I'll get a plant get water. a bottle. Hang on, pause it. Okay. okay, you got a plant water. Got the, a plant water. The real reason that I don't want the kids drinking the plant water is because actually the stuff we did have had been in the basement for several years. Yes. On a shelf. And um, you don't really want to keep bottled water for years, years. on end and then drink it. it well, it's not sterilized, you know. Mm -hmm. It is like... Presumably pretty fresh and clean when they bottle it. Yep. But it can still have spores and it's things that can grow. And things right. and, it, and it's not like um, like canned food. Right. It's not. It's not. It's not um, sterile. Like sterile. Sterile and pasteurized. Yeah. Like I mean, you know what? It says purified, but it's not um, distilled. They mean. They mean filtered. They just filter, filter yeah. exactly. Right. So, um, anyway, I just wanted. I wanted to take a moment to talk about this conundrum. I, I am lucky in the sense that my uh, long COVID symptoms are not this are not so bad, and they do seem to be gradually improving. Very, very slowly. Like uh, I say, slowly. Like I still have, I still have about half the numbness and burning in my feet that I have that I had um, uh, 13 months ago. Right. But it is generally improving. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and have you stopped taking the 
the nanokinase all together? Yeah, I, uh, well, I was taking enzymes daily and I doubled, like tripled the enzyme dose for a while. Taking the enzymes seemed to help during the first year. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem to really be helping anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm pretty certain from having <laughs> gone on and off them that the enzymes did help early on. They're not helping so much now. I've done the experimenting like on and off, you know, right. for a week on, you know, uh, whatnot. Um, the uh, antihistamines definitely help. Mm. Um, and they they have helped as well, mm -hmm. and that's known to to be something that can help because of the way that. Um, so there are two antihistamines types that are helpful because they interfere with the ACE uh, receptors, mm -hmm. and. Um, one of them is actually an antacid. It's yes. re it's really an antihistamine, but it's, it's famotidine. famotidine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, taking a dose of famotidine daily or twice a day seems to help. And I'm also I'm not taking it twice a day anymore. It doesn't seem like I need twice a day. Mm -hmm. But also there's one called cetirizine, which is another. Uh, it targets so it's ACE one and ACE two. Uh, yeah. It's like thing one and thing two. COVID attacks all your ACE. Uh, it's receptors. Damn. All your ACE are belong to us. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> and your CD8s. Um, yeah. So, uh, this does seem to help. I not, won't necessarily help everyone, but, uh, and I'm not taking, for a while I was taking 20 milligrams, or 20, 10 milligrams of each twice a day. Mm -hmm. So four pills, um, which is an unusually high dose. But mm -hmm. I don't think it's be harmful. Basically, if, it's kind of like some of these other medication where, like with vitamin C, mm -hmm. if you have no side effects, your body's probably making use of it. Right. right? If it triggers side effects, then probably you don't need that much. Um, right. But, so my, my regimen is relatively simple, simplified somewhat. We were spending a huge amount on, on enzymes, just like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's going so through, yeah. you know, dozens of pills a week with these enzymes right. um, so I'm glad to be not doing that anymore but mm -hmm. I think maybe it did help in the acute stage it's supposed to help with clotting I'm taking two baby aspirin a day one morning and night not mm -hmm. more than that and I noticed you're not bruising oh yeah when I I used to take baby aspirin just <coughs> prophylactically because it's supposed to help with heart health and I, w and when, when I took it, I would always wind up bruising. bruising. All so over you stopped taking it on my bruised. hands and arms. I'd get bruises. Just bruising but that off. doesn't happen now. Yep. Um, it's, and I'm taking twice as much as taking I used to. Too. So right. So I guess your body's using it. I guess maybe. So, but this is supposed to lower your clotting r r risk. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, COVID fucks up your clotting factors and the clotting cascade and you know if you start studying this you realize that like clotting in the body is this incredibly complex yes. system it seems so straightforward you scrape your knee yeah clot clots no and you, there's so many skin. different fact clotting factors and, <clears throat> and cascades of chemicals that are involved it's really it's this is why people go to medical school you know it's like they learn the Krebs cycle long enough to pass the exam and you learn the like about <laughs> clotting. Right. Anyway. But exercise is a damned if you do and damned if you don't situation. It is. It is. Right. But if I, if, so one of the things we're considering is, uh, and trying, is you and I both go out and um, we say, okay, we're going to work in the garden for 30 minutes. Yep. And no more. That's it. Like doing moderate work like not ba bending rocks, and right. weeding and stuff like that which does involve moving around and we can't do nothing it, because this like physical movement is really important to keeping my joints functional so and spine and, some, and, and so i know there's like this sort of fitness health thing which is and and i have to say a lot of it does really seem pathological right yeah um but it's also true that there are all these sort of holistic things that have significant health impacts that we ignore. Your diet matters. Yeah. Your movement matters. Right. Um, the clean air matters. Clean water matters. Yeah. Right? And um, yes, that's real. That right. is true. But mind you, I'm not trying to say that if you eat 
the right herbs, you'll, you can cure your cancer. No, no, by, no, no. By doing yoga and taking the right herbs and no, this, foods, etc. These these supplements I'm taking for this for this stuff, this is a band aid. This know? is a band aid, right? This isn't a cure. This, this is, is just, just like... trying to reduce my symptoms to a bearable level, right? And hopefully interrupt some of the internal damage that's happening, right? And, but we don't really know. Mm. A lot of this people get pretty far down the the road of lung damage and capillary damage and never feeling a thing. Don't feel anything. Right. Don't feel anything at all. So before they, so by the time you feel something and you go to the doctor, and by the time you're short of breath, you've lost like a significant you know, amount of lung, half capacity. Your lung capacity. Right. But um, so I don't want to just so I don't want to um, um, how shall I say evoke that whole thing where oh gosh you know just do some yoga and eat, you know no 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 get rid of carbs, I, I'm not right? saying that and I'm, I don't think you're saying that and I want to be clear we're yeah, not saying no. that what, what I'm I guess what I'm saying is that I have found it helpful to do what exercise I can yes with for a very strict definition of can yes right and sometimes quite limited mm -hmm. but like Doing what movement I can, I can without a crash or whatnot. Without having right makes me feel better, and yes. I have to. I I have this has forced me to. I mean, oftentimes you know the no pain no gain saying and all mm -hmm. that. And when you know when I used to exercise to extremes, you know, including my my weightlifting when I would take weightlifting supplements and so so that I would recover faster and push my muscles harder and whatnot. Right. Um, yeah, that was relatively extreme. I'm not saying any of that now. Yeah, I'm saying none of that. That's what we're talking back about then. I was kind of programmed myself to ignore all the signals my body was sending and right. interpret the pain as a positive sign. Mm -hmm. And I'm here to tell you that there is a good kind of fatigue that you can get from a workout, which mm -hmm. and if you do it regularly, you know it when you feel it. Your mm -hmm. muscles are pleasantly warmed up and used. Right. And, you know, and it was, it felt good. It felt, feels good afterwards versus pushing yourself too hard, which is not pleasant. Not and, pleasant. And I've had to really learn how to focus very closely on the more subtle signs and symptoms my body is sending me as to like, you should go downstairs and build a bookshelf. You do that. Or like, you, you can rearrange these books. You can do this stuff. You can do some light labor in the basement, some light work. It'll feel, good. it'll feel good and it does but if you push it too much you're gonna be shit in the morning tomorrow's morning meeting you'll be staring into space you won't be able to think you'll be barely had a terrible time waking up you know right. and and your hands and feet will hurt again you know like mm -hmm. all and your dizziness will come back and right. all these things will come back and i'm absolutely not trying like if you are to the point where you can't walk up one flight of stairs without your autonomic nervous system going crazy for the rest of the day. We're not talking don't, no, don't. I'm not talking to you. Don't, you don't know, risk this. Do, the re the do the resting. But listen very closely to the signs. <clears throat> and like, if you can figure out how to walk that line where you get like just enough exercise to get some improvement. Some benefit. Well, because exercise yeah. has intrinsic benefit to your body. Yes, your yeah. body's functioning. Yeah. So you want to get the benefit and... and Little to no yeah. downside. But what these, oh, that was a, a chickadee. It's I didn't want to call it out. No, it's beautiful. It's like this huge right. bumblebee. It's right. so bright. Uh, it's just beautiful. Uh, yeah, yeah. So clearly in our 50s, bird watching, we, we have are. our half snack. Right. No, this is just, um, we have come to, I mean, we're sitting in a fast food parking lot, right? right? But this is, it is a, unabashedly gorgeous spring day and we've waited a long time for a gorgeous spring, spring day. day half these days in april where we thought it was going to be nice it actually went up snowing it was crazy and the other half it was like 80 degrees yeah it was awful it went between yeah, clouds and mosquitoes it's disgusting we had these huge oh. swings in the weather and then we had snow like over and over again in april and just miserable miserable wet days and gray all day mm -hmm. and for a week and it's like this isn't what april's supposed to be like but no this is it is gonna rain but uh, but no, we're having nice, a, it still nice feels window. nice we're yeah. having a really nice spring day and everything's greening up and the trees are flowering and it's it's nice to be out 
even in a fast food parking fast lot, parking looking lot. at the wiring on the, the back of a UPS store. Back of a UPS store. It's good times, man. Good there's times. Few, there's enough trees that we have these gorgeous streaks of color, this brilliant gold chickadee flitting around like, you know, like oh and dandelions so many so many dandelions oh it's it, you can start cleaning your garden out now i know i talk about not cleaning out like, it's but time it's time when there's enough dandelions for bees to eat and all those well, critters yeah, that are living in yeah. the brush to eat yeah and it's primarily dandelions first then it's okay to start clearing away the stuff the, the brush they're living in yeah they're already they've left if they're if they're gonna wake up for the for the, for the spring spring they have already. They, they have already and and their cue for that is uh, dandelions. Everything flowery. Right. So, yeah, so this is one of our half hour gardening things we're doing is starting to clean out the garden beds, mm -hmm. including two, the two uh, circular fire ring beds that have been crushed by delivery trucks, just yeah. smashed. Yeah. It's like, wow, really? Like, really? you managed to back completely out of the driveway across 10 feet of grass and crush the, and crush a garden bed. Yep. Well, well done. Yeah, you know, uh, everyone's We can't complain best. too much because... They're bringing us their food. And we don't. Goodies. We need deliveries more than we used to. Yep. We rely more heavily on that kind of thing now, especially while the car was not Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, I can never wind things up. I can never wind things up. I think that's, I think that's the advice on exercise along COVID. Is it, you know, you probably should be out running marathons. Listen um, to your body very listen closely. Listen to your body very carefully. Get... Get what exercise you can if you can get a little. Be very can. cautious about overly pushing yourself. Well, and and if and if what you can is none, that's okay. That's okay too. You're not doing the, anything wrong. The radical rest is, is also more, extremely valuable. I, I just, in this I context, I have taken I have taken days and even weekends where I basically have said, you know what, I need to rest. I'm not doing anything this weekend. I'm going to spend the weekend in bed. Mm -hmm. And you know, I like read. Mostly sleep and watch. Honestly, on a weekend like that, if I find that I am able to sleep all day, it probably means I needed to sleep, need to all, sleep day. all day. Yeah. Because normally I can't. You know, I just I, I just lie there. <laughs> I can't sleep. I want to emphasize that in this context, the rest is more important than the exercise. The rest and is more. The recovery is more. more is important, the most important. Most important thing. thing. Yeah. And uh, and I think the thing to recognize in our society is that rest is actually the most important thing that we get, that we need. And right? it's, it's Makes the least valued. Possible. It's least valued, and it's the most important thing yeah. for making anything else happen. Yeah. Right. yeah. I only improve on guitar on the days that I'm not playing. Yes. Right. Hey, folks, we are doing a very brief follow-up clip because when we were out yesterday running around, uh, I actually ran out of space on the memory of my recorder, Boop. but we got everything out that we really had to say, and the only thing we actually missed was saying goodbye. So goodbye. Till so next time. Bye. <laughs>